statistics released by the Australian government show that um, we're not actually, Australia is not making a lot of headway in reducing its greenhouse gas emissions. Um, can you tell us a bit about this? Yeah, well, um, these stats show that although we are making um, some modest gains in reducing greenhouse gas emissions from electricity generation, um, you know, converting from uh, coal primarily to wind and solar, um, those uh, small, you know, modest gains are being uh, totally swamped by massive increases in uh, greenhouse gas emissions from other sectors. Uh, and the biggest sort of growing one there is in transport. As a person who has been campaigning for several years uh, for public and active transport and against big projects like West Connects and all these privately owned tollways yeah. that are, are not only changing the shape of our society and our cities, but also grabbing lots and lots of uh, public funding, what does it contribute to the problem we have of rising emissions from transport? Yeah, well, um, the, the spend, um, where the budget allocates really just shows a lot of where the priorities uh, lie. So um, there's vast sums are spent on, on private motorways that don't have uh, satisfactory business cases at all, and then require massive taxpayer subsidy in the form of toll rebates to encourage and get people to drive on them. Um, what money is uh, then left over from that is spent on poorly advised public transport projects that are more about privatisation and property developer sort of uh, land banking uh, ideas. And then the active transport budget in New South Wales is 0.13% of the total uh, transport budget spend in New South Wales. That's uh, really causing uh, like people to go with driving rather than more sustainable um, modes of transport. Um, there's that aspect, which is the physical infrastructure of the spend. But it shouldn't also be underestimated the kind of uh, mental colonisation that we have been uh, inculcated in over a hundred years now of uh, what is called, uh, was being called moto normativity. The idea that a car is an absolutely necessary thing for people to get around and you have to have one and that forms the basis of all movement. That is something that was actually very carefully uh, constructed and socially engineered by uh, big motor companies over the last hundred years. One great source on this history is uh, Professor Peter Norton um, from the United States. He wrote this uh, book, Fighting Traffic, and also uh, Autonorama. Uh, he's probably, probably the world's most foremost historian on, on the history of cars in cities. And uh, probably the most telling in, uh, episode is around the uh, 1920s, uh, when there was a bit of a slump of the economy and the car manufacturers were worried that they weren't going to sell enough cars, um, that they created, artificially created the term jaywalking. And jaywalking, jay was a slur, like bogan or something like that. And they just put it together and they basically, you know, accused anybody of crossing the road, um, <laughs> not at a cr official crossing, as a jaywalker. So they did that to, so to inculcate the idea that roads are for cars. Previously to that, roads were for a whole lot of other things. They were for, you know, walking, cycling. They became uh, very successfully used for um, trams. Um, and they were for shop carts or children to play. Um, but through like many decades of like really well-funded campaigns by those interests, oil, cars, uh, road construction, engineering firms, and so on. Um, through these, they held big, um, big international fairs where it showed the future of the city with all bus bustling with cars. Um, uh, they they got uh, they made uh, television uh, 
program sponsored by uh, General Motors. They had Groucho Marx getting on there and, and creating this America's love affair with your cars and so on. And even in Australia, they got, John, uh, they got Don Bradman in the 1960s to make videos to tell children not to play cricket in the streets. And I that's really interesting. And here's an Australian icon known for his amazing sporting ability in, in cricket telling children, don't play cricket. <laughs> It was framed as, oh, it's not safe, don't do it in the street. You know, get in, mum and dad will pick you up in the car, drive you to the Oval and you can play over there. Um, so yeah, we really got into that sort of whole uh, mindset. How deadly is yeah. the car-based society? Yeah, um, well, there are a billion cars in the world and there are a million deaths every year from car crashes. Uh, in Australia, it's about 1,200. Um, and in the recent years, it has been steadily uh, increasing. Um, one of the factors uh, which is being talked about um, is the size of cars. So uh, in just the, the sheer physics of a collision, if you're in a larger vehicle, you stand a higher chance of survival in a car crash. And so there is a, like an arms race uh, in the car, in, in, in car buyers' minds, oh, it, I'll get a bigger car, I'll be safer. But that means everybody else has to get a bigger car. And then we're experiencing this car bloat. So um, it's, it's economically rational for someone to buy a larger car uh, for their own safety. But for the whole safety of the society as a whole, it, it's, it's dysfunctional. That, that's the cost in terms of physical injury. Yeah. What are the costs of a car-based society at the psychological and the social level? The kind of normal social interactions that you have when you're moving at human speeds of, of walking or, or, or cycling, which is uh, a little bit more sort of on a human scale. Um, you know, there's the interactions that you have uh, day to day with people as you pass them and you say hello and, and so on, or you, you see people in the street corner. But also uh, car culture engenders uh, more, more more distance to be travelled. Uh, by making it easier to travel longer distances, you're sort of encouraged and more people do those longer distances. So what we have seen, um, is that all through Sydney and many countries, is um, the move towards uh, shopping malls. So the zoning regulations allowed that, allowed them to build large shopping malls to compete with the downtown walkable neighbourhood stores. So all through the inner city, you'll see the corners, the sh places that used to have corner stores that no longer have corner stores. And the default is for the large weekly shop where you drive to the mall, uh, you, you know, and you're not interacting with um, the person, the shopkeeper just down the road. Um, and, you know, I, I look even in the 80s uh, in Erskineville and Newtown and the local newsletters and the local businesses, you know, selling, selling uh, lamb and sausages and, and, uh, and uh, rabbits and stuff like that. You know, you could see that there was this real um, uh, small scale sort of like local culture that you experienced and you're familiar with the, the people in your neighbourhood and the local shopkeepers. So that, that's also distances there. And... Um, and then you lose the independence for young people and also older people who, who, who can't or don't drive. Um, their personal in, independence uh, is, is really lacking and that has a very bad impact on their mental health. Um, so you might be aware of a Japanese TV show that's been around for 20 years, it's recently been translated into uh, English. Um, it's called Old Enough. And it just shows five and six year old Japanese children being sent on an errand to the local store by themselves. Um, and you know, they can go and they can go and buy, you know, uh, some mushrooms or whatever from the local store, cross the road and, and be, you know, be quite safe on their way. Whereas Australian children, their parents wouldn't dream of allowing their children to go out and do those things. And that uh, has a tremendous toll on the, feelings of self-worth and independence that young children have and, and contributes to uh, mental health problems in, in later life. Trying to imagine a different shaped society that didn't put uh, roads and, and cars at the centre of it, you know, that prioritised public transport and active transport, that rebuilt community. Yeah. Are we talking about a shift that uh, requires us to step back into the past to a less technologically yeah. developed society? Or is it possible mm. to envisage 
uh, different shaped communities, uh, still with the, the best that technology can offer today. Yeah. Well, you know, most people think of Japan as one of the most high tech countries in the world, and, and it is with regards to uh, transport. So um, over many years post-World War II, Japan spent, um, you know, huge efforts to um, make uh, the, the world's best public transport uh, network. It's not just a, um, a, you know, a lot of subways or a lot of this or, or, or that. It's the integration of those services, the, the high level planning that has on the one hand, um, uh, a high speed rail network, then is supplemented by suburban commuter services, like double deck services for, for, for doing the daily uh, commuter trip. Then on another level, metro services, which provide uh, a lot of the short trips in a big sort of spider web kind of network that can take many smaller, you know, trips to the gym or the shops or other little daily trips that aren't the, the commuter trips. Uh, and then, um, you know, all the, the, the bike, the emphasis on, on, on cycling and walking, pedestrian infrastructure that connects it all. But it's all integrated through timing, the services all line up, the connections from one service to another are all immediate and made as short as possible. So, you know, you can easily connect from one train straight onto the bus, which is waiting for you and, and, and works like clockwork. So, so it's that overall integrated system with technology that's appropriate at each level. Uh, working to, to mean that just any kind of trip you need to make, you can do it in the most you know, environmentally uh, 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 sustainable uh, way. Um, yeah, other measures there, like you, perhaps you might realise if you, if you go to Japan, that Japan largely has no on-street parking. And you think about that, like, that's, what, you mean, the... 140 million people living in dense cities and there's nowhere to park on street. I mean, this this would be unimaginable in a city like Sydney. And they're not, you know, you know in some backwards thing, they're futuristic and, and modern thinking, right? Well, that's because you, you like, the, the street is precious space. The footpath should be wide. The road should be relatively narrow for those rare cases where you know car transport is absolutely necessary and um so uh car parks are are sort of um they're paid car parks that are put um in you know for each city block there'd be one section which is a private car park and you're not allowed to own a car unless you have a place to to park it but that means that um when you need to park it's if there's a spot available for you and that all of the cars are corralled into this one area and the rest of the neighborhood is free of cars so every you know people crossing the road and crossing the street are visible you know in, in sydney here you can't you're not visible above the height of the park to cars um so there's just that 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 creates a, a kind of a completely different streetscape and um a kind of level of safety about about walking around that's that's very different someone might say the obvious difference in Japan is that they had you know a lot more dense populations and therefore necessity mm. drove the shape of this society yeah in Australia many people believe you know there's endless space yeah uh, and therefore we don't need yeah to do this <laughs> this is funny what's as, the truth of this yeah what's the funniest myth I really find that really interesting see um it doesn't matter how much land you have Cities are not about space. They're about proximity. You know, cities emerged from time immemorial because people wanted to be close to the resource. So, you know, cities, you, the distance is the enemy. You want to be close. So you have to plan your land use very carefully around, um, you know, the port or the river or the, or, or the, or the resource or whatever it is. Uh, the crossing of the trade routes. So yeah, having lots of space is not a benefit for a city. It's all, it's all about being close. So yeah, that's just, and, 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 and cities have been deliberately de-densified through conscious, uh, conscious uh, you, you know, policies. The inner city of, 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 of our capital cities used to be much denser, but all the terrace houses used to have many more people 
living in them. Um, and they and they managed to get around very easily on on tram networks. You know, Sydney having the, the one of the largest tram networks, uh, three hundred kilometres of, of track. Um, in the process of of removing that and and pushing people out to suburbia, that's what deliberately created low density car dependent sprawl. So actually, Australian cities were just as dense. Um, you know, as many other cities around the world, they would deliberately de-densify in order to facilitate car dependency. Uh, and, and, and some cities didn't do that. They, they kept their density. They just supplemented and supported it with sub, you know, you know, good, good public transport, good bus services, good, you know, good walking and, and things like that. And after all, Australia has for a long time been and probably still is today one of the most urbanized populations in the whole world yeah yeah we yeah we are like um it's um 95 percent of australian people live in in cities and large towns you know so yeah we the the image of australia is the outback person on the brumby with the dryser bone <laughs> right but the actual you know australian is a very suburban creature now what do you say to people who would argue that Okay, there's a solution at hand now. Let's move to electric cars and electric vehicles, and that will be the problem solved. Yeah. Well, um, uh, the Climate Council uh, wrote a report last year called Shifting Gears, is changing Australia's transport system. And they said that by the year 2030, of course, we'll need a big shift to electric cars but they will actually need to halve the number of cars or halve the total VKT, vehicle kilometres travelled. And um, I don't think that that has really sunk into the average person's thinking. Uh, if we're going to halve the number of cars, if you own a car today, toss a coin to decide whether in five years you'll have a car. That's how proportion that will need to be are reduced by. Um, so electric vehicle charging stations on the street, um, this means that um, you've got to put this infrastructure on the footpath and there's cables and things like that that sort of start to interfere with uh, pedestrians. But also if you want to build actually a fast charger, you're talking, I think it's uh, tens of thousands or hundred thousand dollars for a fast charger, it would be a few hours. But you'd be occupying your car in this precious car space for a number of hours when everybody else is sort of waiting. It's just the economics of it uh, is really uh, not stacking up. Another thing to say is that 50% of a car's lifetime emissions are in its manufacture. All the metals and plastics and everything that go to, to build the car in the first place. So the best level of reduction you can achieve, assuming that you charge your battery entirely from renewables is that you will re you'll achieve a 50% reduction in the transport emissions of your cars. But remember, we've got to get to zero. So, so, so that'll get you halfway. So even, you know, this report is just saying, look, at least by 2030, we've got to halve car use overall and do this, you know, switch what existing, every time an old car is removed, you know, two cars removed, one's removed altogether, and one is converted to um, electric vehicle. And that's by 2030. And then by 2050, another 20 years, we'll be having to reduce car use by another 50%, at least. Hmm. Right. So the problem is really far too urgent just to go to, oh, shift to electric cars. <laughs>